Section 11 of the Junior Classics, Volume 3, Tales from Greece and Rome, edited by William Patton, 1868 to 1936. This LibriVox recording is in the public domain. Recording by Gillian Hendry. The Pomegranate Seeds by Nathaniel Hawthorne, Part 1. Mother Ceres was exceedingly fond of her daughter Proserpina, and seldom let her go alone into the fields. But just at the time when my story begins, the good lady was very busy, because she had the care of the wheat, and the Indian corn, and the rye and barley, and, in short, of the crops of every kind all over the earth. And as the season had thus far been uncommonly backward, it was necessary to make the harvest ripen more speedily than usual. So she put on her turban, made of poppies, a kind of flower which she was always noted for wearing, and got into her car, drawn by a pair of winged dragons, and was just ready to set off. "'Dear mother,' said Proserpina, "'I shall be very lonely while you are away. May I not run down to the shore and ask some of the sea-nymphs to come up out of the waves and play with me?' "'Yes, child,' answered Mother Ceres. "'The sea-nymphs are good creatures, and will never lead you into any harm. But you must take care not to stray away from them.' nor go wandering about the fields by yourself. Young girls without their mothers to take care of them are very apt to get into mischief. The child promised to be as prudent as if she were a grown-up woman, and by the time the winged dragons had whirled the car out of sight, she was already on the shore, calling to the sea nymphs to come and play with her. They knew Proserpina's voice, and were not long in showing their glistening faces and sea-green hair above the water, at the bottom of which was their home. They brought along with them a great many beautiful shells, and sitting down on the moist sand, where the surf wave broke over them, they busied themselves in making a necklace, which they hung around Proserpina's neck. By way of showing her gratitude, the child besought them to go with her a little way into the field, so that they might gather abundance of flowers with which she would make each of her kind playmates a wreath. "'Oh no, dear Proserpina,' cried the sea nymphs, we dare not go with you upon the dry land. We are apt to grow faint, unless at every breath we can snuff up the salt breeze of the ocean. And don't you see how careful we are to let the surf wave break over us every moment or two, so as to keep ourselves comfortably moist? If it were not for that, we should soon look like bunches of uprooted seaweed dried in the sun. It is a great pity, said Proserpina. But do you wait for me here, and I will run and gather my apron full of flowers, and be back again before the surf wave has broken ten times over you. I long to make you some wreaths that shall be as lovely as this necklace of many-coloured shells. We will wait then, answered the sea nymphs, but while you are gone we may as well lie down on a bank of soft sponge under the water. The air today is a little too dry for our comfort but we will pop up our heads every few minutes to see if you are coming. The young Proserpina ran quickly to a spot where only the day before she had seen a great many flowers. These, however, were now a little past their bloom, and wishing to give her friends the freshest and loveliest blossoms, she strayed farther into the fields, and found some that made her scream with delight. Never had she met with such exquisite flowers before, violets so large and fragrant roses with so rich and delicate a blush such superb hyacinths and such aromatic pinks and many others some of which seemed to be of new shapes and colours two or three times moreover she could not help thinking that a tuft of most splendid flowers had suddenly sprouted out of the earth before her very eyes as if on purpose to tempt her a few steps farther Proserpina's apron was soon filled and brimming over with delightful blossoms. She was on the point of turning back, in order to rejoin the sea nymphs, and sit with them on the moist sands, all twining wreaths together. But a little farther on, what should she behold? It was a large shrub, completely covered with the most magnificent flowers in the world. "'The darlings!' cried Proserpina, and then she thought to herself, I was looking at that spot only a moment ago. How strange it is that I did not see the flowers. The nearer she approached the shrub, 
the more attractive it looked, until she came quite close to it, and then, although its beauty was richer than words can tell, she hardly knew whether to like it or not. It bore above a hundred flowers of the most brilliant hues, and each different from the others, but all having a kind of resemblance among themselves, which showed them to be sister blossoms. But there was a deep, glossy lustre on the leaves of the shrub, and on the petals of the flowers, that made Proserpina doubt whether they might not be poisonous. To tell you the truth, foolish as it may seem, she was half inclined to turn round and run away. What a silly child I am, thought she, taking courage. It is really the most beautiful shrub that ever sprang out of the earth. I will pull it up by the roots and carry it home, and plant it in my mother's garden. Holding up her apron full of flowers with her left hand, Proserpina seized the large shrub with the other, and pulled and pulled, but was hardly able to loosen the soil about its roots. What a deep-rooted plant it was! Again the girl pulled with all her might, and observed that the earth began to stir and crack to some distance around the stem. She gave another pull, but relaxed her hold, fancying that there was a rumbling sound right beneath her feet. Did the roots extend down into some enchanted cavern? Then, laughing at herself for so childish a notion, she made another effort. Up came the shrub, and Proserpina staggered back, holding the stem triumphantly in her hand, and gazing at the deep hole which its roots had left in the soil. Much to her astonishment, this hole kept spreading wider and wider, and growing deeper and deeper, until it really seemed to have no bottom. And all the while there came a rumbling noise out of its depths, louder and louder, and nearer and nearer, and sounding like the tramp of horses' hoofs and the rattling of wheels. Too much frightened to run away, she stood straining her eyes into this wonderful cavity, and soon saw a team of four sable horses snorting smoke out of their nostrils, and tearing their way out of the earth with a splendid golden chariot whirling at their heels. They leaped out of the bottomless hole, chariot and all, and there they were, tossing their black manes, flourishing their black tails, and curveting with every one of their hoofs off the ground at once, close by the spot where Proserpina stood. In the chariot sat the figure of a man, richly dressed, with a crown on his head, all flaming with diamonds. He was of a noble aspect, and rather handsome, but looked sullen and discontented, and he kept rubbing his eyes and shading them with his hand, as if he did not live enough in the sunshine to be very fond of its light. As soon as this personage saw the affrighted Proserpina, he beckoned her to come a little nearer. "'Do not be afraid,' said he, with as cheerful a smile as he knew how to put on. "'Come, will not you like to ride a little way with me in my beautiful chariot?' But Proserpina was so alarmed that she wished for nothing but to get out of his reach. And no wonder, the stranger did not look remarkably good-natured in spite of his smile. And as for his voice, its tones were deep and stern, and sounded as much like the rumbling of an earthquake underground as anything else. As is always the case with children in trouble, Proserpina's first thought was to call for her mother. Mother! Mother Ceres! cried she, all in a tremble. Come quickly and save me! But her voice was too faint for her mother to hear. Indeed, it is probable that Ceres was then a thousand miles off, making the corn grow in some far distant country. Nor could it have availed her poor daughter, even had she been within hearing. For no sooner did Proserpina begin to cry out, than the stranger leaped to the ground, caught the child in his arms, and, again mounting his chariot, shook the reins, and shouted to the four black horses to set off. They immediately broke into so swift a gallop that it seemed rather like flying through the air than running along the earth. In a moment, Proserpina lost sight of the pleasant vale of Enna in which she had always dwelt. Another instant, and even the summit of Mount Etna had become so blue in the distance that she could scarcely distinguish it from the smoke that gushed out of its crater. But still the poor child screamed, and scattered her apron full of flowers along the way, and left a long cry trailing behind the chariot, and many mothers to whose ears it came 
ran quickly to see if any mischief had befallen their children. But Mother Ceres was a great way off, and could not hear the cry. As they rode on, the stranger did his best to soothe her. "'Why should you be so frightened, my pretty child?' said he, trying to soften his rough voice. "'I promise not to do you any harm. What, you have been gathering flowers? Wait till you come to my palace, and I will give you a garden full of prettier flowers than those, all made of pearls and diamonds and rubies. Can you guess who I am? They call my name Pluto, and I am the king of diamonds and all other precious stones. Every atom of the gold and silver that lies under the earth belongs to me, to say nothing of the copper and iron, and of the coal mines which supply me with abundance of fuel. Do you see this splendid crown upon my head? You may have it for a plaything. Oh, we shall be very good friends, and you will find me more agreeable than you expect when once we get out of this troublesome sunshine. Let me go home, cried Proserpina. Let me go home. My home is better than your mother's, answered King Pluto. It is a palace all made of gold and crystal windows, and because there is little or no sunshine thereabouts, the apartments are illuminated with diamond lamps. You never saw anything half so magnificent as my throne. If you like, you may sit down on it and be my little queen, and I will sit on the footstool. I don't care for golden palaces and thrones, sobbed Proserpina. Oh, my mother, my mother, carry me back to my mother. But King Pluto, as he called himself, only shouted to his steeds to go faster. Pray do not be foolish, Proserpina, said he, in rather a sullen tone. I offer you my palace and my crown and all the riches that are under the earth and you treat me as if I were doing you an injury. The one thing which my palace needs is a merry little maid to run upstairs and down and cheer up the rooms with her smile, and this is what you must do for King Pluto. Never, answered Proserpina, looking as miserable as she could. I shall never smile again till you set me down at my mother's door. But she might just as well have talked to the wind that whistled past them for Pluto urged on his horses and went faster than ever. Proserpina continued to cry out and screamed so long and so loudly that her poor little voice was almost screamed away, and when it was nothing but a whisper, she happened to cast her eyes over a great broad field of waving grain, and whom do you think she saw? Who but Mother Ceres making the corn grow, and too busy to notice the golden chariot as it went rattling along. The child mustered all her strength and gave one more scream, but was out of sight before Ceres had time to turn her head. King Pluto had taken a road which now began to grow excessively gloomy. It was bordered on each side with rocks and precipices, between which the rumbling of the chariot wheels was reverberated with a noise like rolling thunder. The trees and bushes that grew in the crevices of the rocks had very dismal foliage, and by and by, although it was hardly noon, the air became obscured with a grey twilight. The black horses had rushed along so swiftly that they were already beyond the limits of the sunshine. But the duskier it grew, the more did Pluto's visage assume an air of satisfaction. After all, he was not an ill-looking person, especially when he left off twisting his features into a smile that did not belong to them. Proserpina peeped at his face through the gathering dusk, and hoped that he might not be so very wicked as she at first thought him. Ah, oh, this twilight is truly refreshing, said King Pluto, after being so tormented with that ugly and impertinent glare of the sun. How much more agreeable is lamplight or torchlight, more particularly when reflected from diamonds. It will be a magnificent sight when we get to my palace. Is it much farther? asked Proserpina. And will you carry me back when I have seen it? We will talk of that by and by, answered Pluto. We are just entering my dominions. Do you see that tall gateway before us? When we pass those gates, we are at home. And there lies my faithful mastiff at the threshold. Cerberus, Cerberus, come hither, my good dog. 
So saying, Pluto pulled at the reins, and stopped the chariot right between the tall, massive pillars of the gateway. The mastiff, of which he had spoken, got up from the threshold, and stood on his hind legs, so as to put his forepaws on the chariot wheel. But my stars, what a strange dog it was! Why, he was a big, rough, ugly-looking monster, with three separate heads, and each of them fiercer than the two others. But fierce as they were, King Pluto patted them all. He seemed as fond of his three-headed dog as if it had been a sweet little spaniel with silken ears and curly tail. Cerberus, on the other hand, was evidently rejoiced to see his master, and expressed his attachment as other dogs do, by wagging his tail at a great rate. Proserpina's eyes being drawn to it by its brisk motion, she saw that this tail was neither more nor less than a live dragon with fiery eyes and fangs that had a very poisonous aspect and while the three-headed cerberus was fawning so lovingly on king pluto there was the dragon tail wagging against its will and looking as cross and ill-natured as you can imagine on its own separate account will the dog bite me asked proserpina shrinking closer to pluto what an ugly creature he is oh never fear answered her companion he never harms people unless they try to enter my dominions without being sent for or to get away when i wish to keep them here down cerberus now my pretty proserpina we will drive on on went the chariot and king pluto seemed greatly pleased to find himself once more in his own kingdom he drew proserpina's attention to the rich veins of gold that were to be seen among the rocks and pointed to several places where one stroke of a pickaxe would loosen a bushel of diamonds all along the road indeed there were sparkling gems which would have been of inestimable value above ground but which were here reckoned of the meaner sort and hardly worth a beggar's stooping for not far from the gateway they came to a bridge which seemed to be built of iron pluto stopped the chariot and bade proserpina look at the stream which was gliding so lazily beneath it never in her life had she beheld so torpid so black so muddy-looking a stream its waters reflected no images of anything that was on the banks and it moved as sluggishly as if it had quite forgotten which way it ought to flow and had rather stagnate than flow either one way or the other this is the rather lethe observed king pluto is it not a very pleasant stream i think it a very dismal one said proserpina it suits my taste however answered pluto who was apt to be sullen when anybody disagreed with him at all events its water has one very excellent quality for a single draught of it makes people forget every care and sorrow that has hitherto tormented them only sip a little of it my dear proserpina and you will instantly cease to grieve for your mother and will have nothing in your memory that can prevent your being perfectly happy in my palace i will send for some in a golden goblet the moment we arrive oh no 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 cried proserpina weeping afresh i had a thousand times rather be miserable with remembering my mother than be happy in forgetting her that dear dear mother i never never will forget her we shall see said king pluto you do not know what fine times we will have in my palace here we are just at the portal these pillars are solid gold i assure you he alighted from the chariot and taking proserpina in his arms carried her up a lofty flight of steps into the great hall of the palace it was splendidly illuminated by means of large precious stones of various hues which seemed to burn like so many lamps and glowed with a hundredfold radiance all through the vast apartment and yet there was a kind of gloom in the midst of this enchanted light nor was there a single object in the hall that was really agreeable to behold except the little proserpina herself a lovely child with one earthly flower which she had not let fall from her hand it is my opinion that even king pluto had never been happy in his palace and that this was the true reason why he had stolen away proserpina in order that he might have something to love, instead of cheating his heart any longer with this tiresome magnificence. And though he pretended to dislike the sunshine of the upper world, 
yet the effect of the child's presence, bedimmed as she was by her tears, was as if a faint and watery sunbeam had somehow or other found its way into the enchanted hall. Pluto now summoned his domestics, and bade them lose no time in preparing a most sumptuous banquet, and, above all things, not to fail of setting a golden beaker of the water of Lethe by Proserpina's plate. "'I will neither drink that nor anything else,' said Proserpina, "'nor will I taste a morsel of food, even if you keep me for ever in your palace.' "'I should be sorry for that,' replied King Pluto, patting her cheek for he really wished to be kind, if he had only known how. "'You are a spoiled child, I perceive, my little Proserpina, but when you see the nice things which my cook will make for you, your appetite will quickly come again.' Then, sending for the head cook, he gave strict orders that all sorts of delicacies, such as young people are usually fond of, should be set before Proserpina. He had a secret motive in this, for you are to understand it is a fixed law that when persons are carried off to the land of magic, if they once taste any food there, they can never get back to their friends. Now, if King Pluto had been cunning enough to offer Proserpina some fruit, or bread and milk, which was the simple fare to which the child had always been accustomed, it is very probable that she would soon have been tempted to eat it. But he left the matter entirely to his cook, who, like all other cooks, considered nothing fit to eat unless it were rich pastry, or highly seasoned meat, or spiced sweet cakes, things which Proserpina's mother had never given her, and the smell of which quite took away her appetite instead of sharpening it. But my story must now clamber out of King Pluto's dominions and see what Mother Ceres has been about since she was bereft of her daughter. We had a glimpse of her, as you remember half hidden among the waving grain, while the four black steeds were swiftly whirling along the chariot in which her beloved Proserpina was so unwillingly borne away. You recollect, too, the loud scream which Proserpina gave, just when the chariot was out of sight. Of all the child's outcries, this last shriek was the only one that reached the ears of Mother Ceres. She had mistaken the rumbling of the chariot wheels for a peal of thunder, and imagined that a shower was coming up, and that it would assist her in making the corn grow. But at the sound of Proserpina's shriek, she started and looked about in every direction, not knowing whence it came, but feeling almost certain that it was her daughter's voice. It seemed so unaccountable, however, that the girl should have strayed over so many lands and seas, which she herself could not have traversed without the aid of her winged dragons, that the good series tried to believe that it must be the child of some other parent and not her own darling Proserpina, who had uttered this lamentable cry. Nevertheless, it troubled her with a vast many tender fears, such as are ready to bestir themselves in every mother's heart, when she finds it necessary to go away from her dear children, without leaving them under the care of some maiden aunt, or other such faithful guardian. So she quickly left the field in which she had been so busy, and, as her work was not half done, the grain looked next day as if it needed both sun and rain, and as if it were blighted in the ear and had something the matter with its roots. The pair of dragons must have had very nimble wings, for in less than an hour Mother Ceres had alighted at the door of her home and found it empty. Knowing, however, that the child was fond of sporting on the seashore, she hastened thither as fast as she could, and there beheld the wet faces of the poor sea nymphs peeping over a wave. All this while the good creatures had been waiting on the bank of sponge, and once every half minute or so had popped up their four heads above water to see if their playmate were yet coming back. When they saw Mother Ceres, they sat down on the crest of the surf wave and let it toss them ashore at her feet. "'Where is Proserpina?' cried Ceres. "'Where is my child? Tell me, you naughty sea nymphs, have you enticed her under the sea?' "'Oh, no, good mother Ceres,' said the innocent sea-nymphs, tossing back their green ringlets and looking her in the face. "'We should never dream of such a thing. Proserpina has been at play with us, it is true, but she left us a long while ago, meaning only to run a little way upon the dry land and gather some flowers for a wreath. This was early in the day, and we have seen nothing of her since.' 
Ceres scarcely waited to hear what the nymphs had to say before she hurried off to make inquiries all through the neighbourhood. But nobody told her anything that could enable the poor mother to guess what had become of Proserpina. A fisherman, it is true, had noticed her little footprints in the sand as he went homeward along the beach with a basket of fish. A rustic had seen the child stooping to gather flowers. Several persons had heard either the rattling of chariot wheels or the rumbling of distant thunder, and one old woman, while plucking vervain and catnip, had heard a scream, but supposed it to be some childish nonsense, and therefore did not take the trouble to look up. The stupid people! It took them such a tedious while to tell the nothing that they knew, that it was dark night before Mother Ceres found out that she must seek her daughter elsewhere. So she lighted a torch and set forth, resolving never to come back until Proserpina was discovered. In her haste and trouble of mind, she quite forgot her car and the winged dragons, or it may be she thought that she could follow up the search more thoroughly on foot. At all events, this was the way in which she began her sorrowful journey, holding her torch before her and looking carefully at every object along the path. And as it happened, she had not gone far before she found one of the magnificent flowers which grew on the shrub that Proserpina had pulled up. Ha! Ah, thought Mother Ceres, examining it by torchlight. Here is mischief in this flower. The earth did not produce it by any help of mine, nor of its own accord. It is the work of enchantment, and is therefore poisonous, and perhaps it has poisoned my poor child. But she put the poisonous flower in her bosom, not knowing whether she might ever find any other memorial of Proserpina. All night long, at the door of every cottage and farmhouse, Ceres knocked and called up the weary labourers to inquire if they had seen her child, and they stood, gaping and half asleep, at the threshold, and answered her pityingly, and besought her to come in and rest. At the portal of every palace, too, she made so loud a summons, that the menials hurried to throw open the gate, thinking that it must be some great king or queen who would demand a banquet for supper and a stately chamber to repose in. And when they saw only a sad and anxious woman with a torch in her hand and a wreath of withered poppies on her head, they spoke rudely and sometimes threatened to set the dogs upon her. But nobody had seen Proserpina, nor could give Mother Ceres the least hint which way to seek her. Thus passed the night and still she continued her search without sitting down to rest, or stopping to take food, or even remembering to put out the torch, although first the rosy dawn, and then the glad light of the morning sun, made its red flame look thin and pale. But I wonder what sort of stuff this torch was made of, for it burned dimly through the day, and at night was as bright as ever, and never was extinguished by the rain or wind, in all the weary days and nights, while Ceres was searching for Proserpina. It was not merely of human beings that she asked tidings of her daughter. In the woods and by the streams, she met creatures of another nature, who used in those old times to haunt the pleasant and solitary places, and were very sociable with persons who understood their language and customs, as Mother Ceres did. Sometimes, for instance, she tapped with her finger against the knotty trunk of a majestic oak, and immediately its rude bark would cleave asunder, and forth would step a beautiful maiden, who was the Hamadryad of the oak, dwelling inside of it, and sharing its long life, and rejoicing when its green leaves sported with the breeze. But not one of these leafy damsels had seen Proserpina. Then, going a little farther, Ceres would perhaps come to a fountain, gushing out of a pebbly hollow in the earth, and would dabble with her hand in the water. Behold, up through its sandy and pebbly bed, along with the fountain's gush, a young woman with dripping hair would arise and stand gazing at Mother Ceres, half out of the water, and undulating up and down with its ever restless motion. But when the mother asked whether her poor lost child had stopped to drink out of the fountain, the naiad, with weeping eyes, for these water nymphs had tears to spare for everybody's grief, would answer, No in a murmuring voice, which was just like the murmur of the stream. Often, likewise, she encountered fawns, who looked like sunburnt country people, except that they had hairy ears and little horns upon their foreheads, and the hinder legs of goats, 
on which they gambled merrily about the woods and fields. They were a frolicsome kind of creature, but grew as sad as their cheerful dispositions would allow when Ceres inquired for her daughter, and they had no good news to tell. But sometimes she came suddenly upon a rude gang of satyrs, who had faces like monkeys and horses' tails behind them, and who were generally dancing in a very boisterous manner, with shouts of noisy laughter. When she stopped to question them, they would only laugh the louder, and make new merriment out of the lone woman's distress. How unkind of those ugly satyrs! And once, while crossing a solitary sheep pasture, she saw a personage named Pan, sitting at the foot of a tall rock, and making music on a shepherd's flute. He, too, had horns and hairy ears and goat's feet. But being acquainted with Mother Ceres, he answered her question as civilly as he knew how, and invited her to taste some milk and honey out of a wooden bowl. But neither could Pan tell her what had become of Proserpina any better than the rest of these wild peoples. And thus Mother Ceres went wandering about for nine long days and nights, finding no trace of Proserpina, unless it were now and then a withered flower, and these she picked up and put in her bosom, because she fancied that they might have fallen from the poor child's hand. All day she travelled onward through the hot sun, and at night again the flame of the torch would redden and gleam along the pathway, and she continued her search by its light, without ever sitting down to rest. On the tenth day she chanced to espy the mouth of a cavern, within which, though it was bright noon everywhere else, there would have been only a dusky twilight, but it so happened that a torch was burning there. It flickered and struggled with the duskiness, but could not half light up the gloomy cavern with all its melancholy glimmer. Ceres was resolved to leave no spot without a search, so she peeped into the entrance of the cave and lighted it up a little more by holding her own torch before her. In so doing, she caught a glimpse of what seemed to be a woman sitting on the brown leaves of the last autumn, a great heap of which had been swept into the cave by the wind. This woman, if woman it were, was by no means so beautiful as many of her sex, for her head, they tell me, was shaped very much like a dog's, and by way of ornament she wore a wreath of snakes around it. But Mother Ceres, the moment she saw her, knew that this was an odd kind of a person, who put all her enjoyment in being miserable, and never would have a word to say to other people, unless they were as melancholy and wretched as she herself delighted to be. I am wretched enough now, thought poor Ceres, to talk with this melancholy Hecate, were she ten times sadder than ever she was yet. So she stepped into the cave and sat down on the withered leaves by the dog-headed woman's side. In all the world, since her daughter's loss, she had found no other companion. Oh, Hecate, said she, if ever you lose a daughter, you will know what sorrow is. Tell me for pity's sake. Have you seen my poor child Proserpina pass by the mouth of your cavern? No, answered Hecate, in a cracked voice, and sighing betwixt every word or two. No, Mother Ceres, I have seen nothing of your daughter, but my ears, you must know, are made in such a way that all cries of distress and of fright all over the world, are pretty sure to find their way to them. And nine days ago, as I sat in my cave, making myself very miserable, I heard the voice of a young girl shrieking as if in great distress. Something terrible has happened to the child, you may rest assured, as well as I could judge a dragon or some other cruel monster was carrying her away. You kill me by saying so, cried Ceres, almost ready to faint. Where was the sound, and which way did it seem to go? It passed very swiftly along, said Hecate, and at the same time there was a heavy rumbling of wheels towards the eastward. I can tell you nothing more, except that 
In my honest opinion, you will never see your daughter again. The best advice I can give you is to take up your abode in this cavern, where we will be the two most wretched women in the world. Not yet, dark Hecate, replied Ceres. But do you first come with your torch and help me to seek for my lost child, and when there shall be no more hope of finding her, if that black day is ordained to come, then, if you will give me room to fling myself down, either on these withered leaves or on the naked rock, I will show you what it is to be miserable. But until I know that she has perished from the face of the earth, I will not allow myself space even to grieve. The dismal Hecate did not much like the idea of going abroad into the sunny world, but then she reflected that the sorrow of the disconsolate series would be like a gloomy twilight round about them both, let the sun shine ever so brightly, and that therefore she might enjoy her bad spirits quite as well as if she were to stay in the cave. So she finally consented to go, and they set out together both carrying torches, although it was broad daylight and clear sunshine. The torchlight seemed to make a gloom, so that the people whom they met along the road could not very distinctly see their figures, and indeed, if they once caught a glimpse of Hecate, with the wreath of snakes round her forehead, they generally thought it prudent to run away, without waiting for a second glance. As the pair travelled along in this woebegone manner, a thought struck Ceres. There is one person, she exclaimed, who must have seen my poor child, and can doubtless tell what has become of her. Why did not I think of him before? It is Phoebus. What? said Hecate. The young man that always sits in the sunshine. Oh, pray, do not think of going near him. He is a gay, light, frivolous young fellow, and will only smile in your face. And besides, there is such a glare of the sun about him, that he will quite blind my poor eyes, which I have almost wept away already. You have promised to be my companion, answered Ceres. Come, let us make haste, or the sunshine will be gone, and Phoebus along with it. Accordingly, they went along in quest of Phoebus, both of them sighing grievously, and Hecate, to say the truth, making a great deal worse lamentation than Ceres, for all the pleasure she had, you know, lay in being miserable, and therefore she made the most of it. By and by, after a pretty long journey, they arrived at the sunniest spot in the whole world. There they beheld a beautiful young man, with long curling ringlets, which seemed to be made of golden sunbeams. His garments were like light summer clouds, and the expression of his face was so exceedingly vivid that Hecate held her hands before her eyes, muttering that he ought to wear a black veil. Phoebus, for this was the very person whom they were seeking, had a lyre in his hands, and was making its chords tremble with sweet music, at the same time singing a most exquisite song which he had recently composed. For besides a great many other accomplishments, this young man was renowned for his admirable poetry. As Ceres and her dismal companion approached him, Phoebus smiled on them so cheerfully that Hecate's wreath of snakes gave a spiteful hiss, and Hecate heartily wished herself back in her cave. But as for Ceres, she was too earnest in her grief either to know or care whether Phoebus smiled or frowned. Phoebus, exclaimed she, I am in great trouble and have come to you for assistance. Can you tell me what has become of my dear child Proserpina? Proserpina, Proserpina, did you call her name? answered Phoebus, endeavouring to recollect, for there was such a continual flow of pleasant ideas in his mind that he was apt to forget what had happened no longer than yesterday. Ah, yes, I remember her now. A very lovely child indeed. I am happy to tell you, my dear madam, that I did see the little Proserpina not many days ago. You may make yourself perfectly easy about her. She is safe and in excellent hands. 
"Oh! where is my dear child?" cried Ceres, clasping her hands and flinging herself at his feet. "Why," said Phoebus and, as he spoke, he kept touching his lyre, so as to make a thread of music run in and out among his words "as the little damsel was gathering flowers (and she has really a very exquisite taste for flowers), she was suddenly snatched up by King Pluto, and carried off to his dominions. I have never been in that part of the universe; but the royal palace, I am told, is built in a very noble style of architecture, and of the most splendid and costly materials. Gold, diamonds, pearls, and all manner of precious stones, will be your daughter's ordinary playthings. I recommend to you, my dear lady, to give yourself no uneasiness. Proserpina's sense of beauty will be duly gratified, and even in spite of the lack of sunshine, she will lead a very enviable life. Hush! Say not such a word, answered Ceres indignantly. What is there to gratify her heart? What are all the splendours you speak of without affection? I must have her back again. Will you go with me, Phoebus, to demand my daughter of this wicked Pluto? Pray excuse me, replied Phoebus, with an elegant obeisance. I certainly wish you success, and regret that my own affairs are so immediately pressing that I cannot have the pleasure of attending you. Besides, I am not upon the best of terms with King Pluto. To tell you the truth, his three-headed mastiff would never let me pass the gateway, for I should be compelled to take a sheaf of sunbeams along with me and those, you know, are forbidden things in Pluto's kingdom. Ah, Phoebus, said Ceres, with bitter meaning in her words, you have a harp instead of a heart. Farewell. Will you not stay a moment, asked Phoebus, and hear me turn the pretty and touching story of Proserpina into extemporary verses? But Ceres shook her head and hastened away, along with Hecate. Phoebus, who, as I have told you, was an exquisite poet, forthwith began to make an ode about the poor mother's grief, and if we were to judge of his sensibility by this beautiful production, he must have been endowed with a very tender heart. But when a poet gets into the habit of using his heart-strings to make chords for his lyre, he may thrum upon them as much as he will, without any great pain to himself. Accordingly, though Phoebus sang a very sad song, he was as merry all the while as were the sunbeams amid which he dwelt. End of section 11